Welcome to the Topics in Differentiation chapter in AP Calculus. So we know that the derivative is the tangent line at a point, but what are the units of the derivative? Well, that clearly depends on the units for the axes. In this graph, for example, we are looking at the progression of a virus with thousands of people on the y on the y axis and time on the x axis. The units for the derivative will be the units for the y axis divided by the units on the x-axis. Here, it'll be thousands of people per day. Another type of problem you might see is where you are asked to interpret the meaning of a derivative. If I said that in the above graph, the derivative at x equals 6 is 10, what does that mean? First of all, the x equals 6 part means that the point of interest is at 6 days. Also, we know that the derivative of this graph has units of thousands of people per day. So since the derivative is 10, the rate of change is 10,000 people per day. At 6 days, 10,000 people are being infected per day. So that's what this means. Now we're moving on to different types of derivatives. First is something called implicit differentiation. This is when we differentiate a variable with respect to another variable. Until now, we have only been differentiating with respect to the same variable, usually x. What we're going to do differently is that since y is a function of x, we're going to use the chain rule and multiply by dy dx. In this example, the x squared term would just become 2x, but for the y squared term, we would add a dy dx on the end, since we're not differentiating with respect to y. This is great, because dy dx is what we're solving for. So now we can just solve this equation for dy dx. And we're done. Okay, next is the derivatives of the inverse trig functions. I'm not going to make you wait while I write each one out. Again, notice the similarities. All functions starting with a C have a negative in the front, and the three sets of similarly named, deriv similarly named functions have similar derivatives. The derivatives of logarithmic and exponential functions are pretty straightforward. For logarithmic functions, the, deriv the derivative of log base b of x is 1 over x times the natural log of b. For the natural log function, which remember is just log base e of x, your derivative is going to be 1 over x times the natural log of e. Since the natural log of e is just 1, this is just equal to 1 over x. Logarithmic differentiation can be very useful, especially when you have a lot of things being multiplied together, or you have a function being raised to another function. Just remember the properties of logs from Algebra 2. For exponential functions, this is where you have something to the power of x. The derivative is going to be b to the x times the natural log of b. For e to the x, its derivative will be e to the x times the natural log of e. And I should put a d dx here for each of these. And again here, natural log of e is just 1, so its derivative is just going to be e to the x. Isn't that really cool, how the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x? And also, a warning for both exponential and logarithmic functions. If there are multiple functions involved, don't forget the chain rule. Just multiply your final answer with the derivative of the other function. Now we're moving on to inverse functions. An inverse function is a function that undoes another function. For a function f of x, its inverse is defined as the function g of x, where f of g of x equals x. If f of a equals b, since g of x undoes that function, we'll say that g of b equals a. And now here's where the calculus comes in. If we know the derivative of f, we can say that f prime of a is equal to 1 over g prime of b. You'll, see, you'll, you'll often either be given tidbits of information or a table of data values and asked to use this equation to find something else. Also, remember interpreting the derivative from a few minutes ago? Well, 
They might also ask you to interpret the, deriv the meaning of the inverse function. Just remember that the inverse function does the opposite of what the original function does. Related rates. These are problems where you'll have to compare how quickly two different things are changing. I'll show you the steps that you take with pretty much any related rates problem while going through a classic example, a falling ladder. First, draw a picture. In our case, it's a right triangle with a hypotenuse of 10. And I'll call the sides x and y. Next, identify what we know. We know the hypotenuse. We know how quickly the bottom of the ladder is falling as time changes. So we know dx dt is 5 feet per second. And we know x, which is the distance from the wall to the bottom of the ladder at the time of interest. We also secretly know y by the Pythagorean theorem, or as mind your decisions likes to call it, the Goju theorem. Anyways, this is a 6, 8, 10 right triangle. So the height at the point of interest is going to be 8. So we know that y equals 8. The variable we want to find is the rate of change of the height of the ladder as time changes, or dy dt. Next, write an equation relating the variables. Like I said before, we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem, or x squared plus y squared is going to equal, in this case, 10 squared. Next, we need to take the derivative of this equation, since we're finding the rate of change. Since we're differentiating with respect to t, this will be implicit differentiation, meaning we will, not, we will need to add a dx dt and a dy dt. Differentiating this gives us 2x dx dt plus 2y dy dt, uh, 2, 2y dy dt equals 0. This is awesome since we know three of the four variables in our equation. From our list of known variables, we know x, we know dx dt, and we know y. Putting this in our equation and solving for dy dt gives us that it is equal to negative 15 over 4. It's negative because the latter is moving down. The units for this will be the units for y over the units for t, or feet per second. Writing this in sentence form, the top of the ladder is falling at a rate of 15 over 4 feet per second. So that's our sentence. On to local linear approximation. This is the way to approximate things, like the square root of 9.03. Now remember point slope form from forever ago? y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Well, if we have a function like the square root of x and we want to estimate the value of a point, we can take the derivative of a nearby point, nearby point and use the derivative line <coughs> to estimate the point we want. So we first need to choose a point close to 9.03 that we know the square root of. The closer it is, the closer the approximation will be. The obvious choice is 9, which we know the square root of. Plugging that into our form, we have y minus 3 is equal to m times x minus 9. All we need is the slope. To find it, we're going to take the derivative of the, f of the square root function and plug in the x value of the nearby point. So the derivative of the square root of x at x equals 9. This is going to be 1 over 2 times the square root of 9, which is 1 over 6. So the slope is 1 sixth. Since we want the estimation at 9.03, plug this in for m. We get y minus 3 is equal to 1 sixth times x minus 9. And then we want to find the estimation at 9.03. So plug in 9.03 for x. We now have an equation which we can solve for y. 
which will give us an estimate of 3.005. The actual value of the square root of 9.03 is 3.004996. So our estimate was pretty spot on. Obviously, this wouldn't work so well to estimate the square root of a number like 11, which is far from any perfect squares. Also, the estimate will be an overestimate, so it will be an overestimate if it's concave down, and it'll be an underestimate if the function is concave up. Okay, so the last topic in this unit is L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital's rule is a neat trick to evaluate certain limits. If plugging in the desired value directly leads to an indeterminate form, any one of these, then you can use L'Hopital's rule. What it says is that this limit is equal to the limit as x approaches c of the derivative of the top over the derivative of the bottom. Take the derivative of the top and the bottom separately. Do not use the quotient rule. Just treat them like two totally different things. Once you do that, plug in the number again and see if it works. Sometimes it will, or maybe you'll get an indeterminate form again. If you get it again, just take the derivative again. It will work as long as you have an indeterminate form. If you have a constant over zero, a positive constant other than one to infinity, and so on, using L'Hopital's rule will give you the wrong answer. Okay, finally we're done. This was kind of long, but I had to do a bunch of examples to explain the topics properly. Anyways, I hope you found this video helpful, and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.